Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back and we're going to talk about meiosis today. Remember, mitosis was the process by which identical daughter cells are produced. There's two of them produced, and they are diploid cells, and those are for zygote cells and for somatic cells. So one of the questions is, why is sexual reproduction even in existence? Because asexual reproduction is very quick and efficient. It doesn't require a partner, and it, however, it produces all clones. There's no genetic variation at all. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, is more costly in energy terms uh, because male and female partners have to find each other and exchange their genetic material. It's energetically expensive to construct and use mate-attracting body parts. Uh, for example, flowers are mate-attracting body parts. But the variation introduced by sex has selective advantages for survival in changing environments. So sexual reproduction is typically favored in any environment that changes at all. So let's introduce the concept of alleles. You have to think of homologs. Remember homologs, you, you get one parent, one from one parent, one from the other parent, and chromo both chromosomes number four are homologs. Meiosis begins with a diploid germ cell, which is, in our case, a 2N equals 46 chromosomes, um, and produces haploid gametes, and in human case, the gametes have 23. In diploid cells, there are two chromosomes of each type called the homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes line up. Even unequally matched sex chromosomes line up during meiosis. Each gamete produced by meiosis has one of each pair of homologous chromos chromosomes, so it's haploid. In asexual reproduction, one parent passes a duplicate of its genes, so the, uh, or the DNA molecules, to its offspring which can only be genetically identical clones of the parent. In sexual reproduction, each parent contributes one gene for each trait. Genes for each trait come in slightly different forms called alleles. Originally, these are produced by mutation. Meiosis shuffles the alleles during gametic formation, and fertilization produces offspring with unique combinations of alleles. The variation generated by sexual reproduction is the testing ground for natural selection and is the basis for evolutionary change. Okay, so meiosis goes through two divisions, not one. In some ways, meiosis resembles mitosis. The chromosomes are duplicated during interphase to form sister chromosomes that are held together at the centromere, and chromosomes are moved by the microtubules of the spindle apparatus. But unlike mitosis, meiosis has two ser series of divisions, meiosis I and meiosis II. During meiosis I, homologous chromosomes pair, and the cytoplasm divides later. Each of the two daughter cells receives a haploid number of chromosomes, and each chromosome is still duplicated. During meiosis II, the sister chromatids of each chromosome separate, and the cytoplasm divides again, resulting in four haploid cells. So let's take a look at each individual part of meiosis I and meiosis II to take a better look at them. Before meiosis begins, it duplicates the chromosomes, just like during the S phase prior to mitosis. In prophase I, the nucleus disappears, spindle fibers form, and chromatid pairs form. So that's completely the same thing as my mitosis. A major difference, though, occurs in the separating um, that separates this prophase from that of mitosis. The chromatid pairs line up with their homologous pair, forming a tetrad. So they actually join together in a group. This tetrad contains two original homologous chromosomes and their duplicates. The process of crossing over also occurs, which creates genetic diversity in the chromosomes. Crossing over occurs when pieces of two homologous chromosomes switch places and end up on the other chromosome. So they're actually exchanging physical pieces. In metaphase one, the tetrads line up at the center of the cell. 
The tetrads split and move in the opposite directions during anaphase one, and during this phase, the sister chromatids move away from the other homologous set. After telophase one, two cells form, and each contains a complete set of chromosomes in the form of chromatid pairs. And then we go right into prophase two, and in some cases, the cell cytoplasm doesn't even divide, but sometimes it does. The process continues moving the chromatid pairs toward the center of the cell. They're in the center in metaphase two, and in anaphase two, the chromatid pairs are then split and move to the individual chromosomes toward the opposite poles. Okay, so I've used a couple of terms and they get a little confusing, so just be aware. In meiosis one, we talk about tetrads and chromosomes. In meiosis two, we talk about chromatids and chromosomes. Once the chromatids have split, the pairs have split, they're then called chromosomes. Okay, so I don't want you to get confused, but it tends to repeat itself. And finally, in telophase two, each of the two cells will begin to split in half and produce two more cells, bringing the total to four. Each of these cells contains half the normal chromosomes, so they are haploid. Now meiosis is extremely important, it's part of sexual reproduction, and it produces a lot of variability in traits. There's a lot of ways that it does that, and so I'm going to talk about one of them, crossing over. Crossing over that happens in prophase one happens because the homologous chromosomes pair up, the non-sister chromatids exchange segments during crossing over, and because the alleles for the same trait can vary, new combinations of genes in each chromosome can result and this is one source of genetic variation. So in other words, the effect of crossing over is genetic recombination. The second part of how genetic variation happens during meiosis is the random alignment. In metaphase one, homologous chromosomes randomly line up at the spindle equator. And so during anaphase one, the homologous chromosomes, which are still duplicated, separate into two haploid cells each of which has a random mix of maternal and paternal chromosomes. And then finally, the third area where genetic recombination or genetic variation can happen is that every time a human sperm or egg forms, the possible combinations of chromosomes equal two to the 23rd power because we have 23 pairs. So that is 8,388,608 possible chromosome combinations without crossing over and without that random alignment. That's a lot. And so when you're randomly mixing, you it's almost impossible to get identical people um, unless you have an identical twin, which is formed in a different way. And we'll talk about that later. For plants, it's a little bit different because they produce spores. Sometimes we call they develop into seeds and sometimes they don't. Plants actually have two different phases. They have a diploid plant and they have a haploid plant. And in some plants, you only see one kind and in some plants you see both kinds. Events such as spore formation may occur between meiosis and gamete formation. Haploid spores can germinate into the haploid gamete producing bodies or gametophytes or gamete plants. Gamete producing bodies and spore producing bodies develop during the life cycle of plants and so this is fairly complicated. The sporophyte is diploid, the gametophyte is haploid, and sometimes in some plants it's two different plants, and sometimes the sporophyte and the gametophyte are part of one plant. More on that when we get to plants in second semester. In animal life cycles it's a little bit more simplified because the only haploid stage happens in the gametes or to produce the gametes. So there's no haploid animal. It's always a diploid multicellular animal that has haploid cells in the gametes and that's it. In humans, it's a little bit different. In females, Meiosis and gamete formation are called oogenesis because oo is the prefix meaning egg and genesis means to create. So the germ cell, which is diploid or 2N, so it's way up there at the top, the oogonium, 
produces a primary oocyte, which is also 2N. It undergoes meiosis 1, and so it produces a secondary oocyte, which is haploid, and it produces one large one and one small one. The small one's called a polar body. Okay. Meiosis II then goes, goes uh, takes place, and the first polar body also divides, although it's not shown on this diagram, and you end up putting one ovum and three polar bodies as a result. The ovum, the single ovum that is produced from oogenesis, is the only cell that is capable of being fertilized by a sperm, and the polar bodies eventually wither and die. Now the reason why it does this is because the ovum has to have a lot of cytoplasm because all of the cellular characteristic that develop in the zygote come from the mother. It's not 50-50. Cellular characteristics like the mitochondrial, um, the mitochondrial are all inherited from your mom. Um, a lot of the cells, like the way the centrioles divide and things like that, that's all inherited from your mom because the dad only produces the genes. It only gives you the chromosomes. It doesn't give you all the rest of it. Okay, so the ovum has to be pretty big. And the ovum is the largest cell in the human body. You can see it with the naked eye because of this cytoplasmic concentration into the ovum. Spermatogenesis is a lot more sim simplified. It's very much just like meiosis, like we just laid out. There's no separation as far as, you know, putting all the cytoplasm in one or anything like that. So meiosis and gamete formation are called spermatogenesis in the males. So you start with a germ cell, which is spermatogonia, and it produces the primary spermatocyte, which is still a diploid cell. It undergoes the first my meiosis, and you get two secondary spermatocytes, which are haploid now. They then divide during the second part of meiosis, and they give you four spermatids. However, in males, spermatids can't fertilize the egg. They have to have some additions added onto it. And so they change in form over time, and each develops a tail to become mature spermatozoa or sperm. Okay, without the, the tail, they can't do diddly squat. And so they have to develop. And so there's in the male reproductive structures in the testes and the associated organs with the testes, there's actually tubes that they take their time to get through so that the tails have time to develop before the sperm are released. There's even more genetic shuffling during fertilization events because the diploid chromosome number is restored at fertilization in the zygote when two very different gametic nuclei fuse to form the zygote. So just as a reminder, ways that variation is created during sexual reproduction. It comes from three primary sources. One, crossing over during prophase one. Two, Random alignments at metaphase one that lead to millions of combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes in each gamete. And three, of all the genetically diverse gametes produced, chance will determine which two meet at fertilization and produce that zygote. Okay, for your review, I would like you to draw this chart in your notes, please. I'd like you to um, review the mitosis and meiosis lectures and fill in this chart. It's important because what you're going to see is this will help you to remember the different characteristics of mitosis versus meiosis and remember how it comes about. So take some time, review the lectures, review your notes and review your textbook and go ahead and fill in this chart in your notes. Make sure you study this chart because it will become important for the final exam, for quizzes and, and so on. Again, just like always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me via email or during office hours, and have a fantastic day.